Hello and welcome to Mafti UK. Two days in the woods, hammocking, relaxing, chilling. I've also brought my rifle with me as well. You will see me later making this coffee throughout the video. Um, I'd like to dedicate this video, some of the video, to uh, Mark from uh, Wire Explorer. Um, reason being, he's just got into his hammocking. He's just looking at some gear to purchase. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over a few things um, quite quickly, naming a few parts, their uses and what, what they're for and everything like that. Um, and that's, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to do a few shout outs later as well. I'm going to do a walkout hunt later, but you won't say anything to that. As I always say to you, if this is, I don't show hunting on my videos. Although I come up here to do what I've got to do, I will not show you that on video. It's, there's plenty of videos for you to see if you want to see all that stuff. Great night last night, really comfortable. Uh, and uh, let's move on, shall we? Let's take you from the start. That is known as a gathered end. Um, what I have on there are my continuous loops. These are continuous loops which attach to it and built into my continuous loop is my drip ring. Attached to my drip ring is what's known as a whoopee sling. A whoopee sling is an adjustable sling that allows you to hammer, hang a hammock with absolutely zero stretch whatsoever. This is one eighth. The military arm maneuvers around here at the moment, so that noise in the background is that is a Merlin. I've seen them going around earlier. There's two Chinooks, a Merlin, a C-130. That's, that's the two Merlins. I've been in them. So I'll show you a bit more about how that's adjustable later. But for now, that then is attached to my carabiner. On my carabiner, I also have hanging what I would call a... Well, that is just a peg, but I call it my Marlin spike so you'll understand and finally on the end of there are my tree huggers the tree huggers go around the tree to stop the ants still cutting into it and damaging the bark and damaging the tree itself so this is a way of protecting the tree you don't necessarily need tree huggers but it is good practice and you can't be criticized for going down the good practice route so that's what we're going to do. Let's have a look at this tree over here. Now, these aren't large trees I'm connecting up to. They are a multiple of smaller trees. However, that means I've got no deadfall above me. And that leads me on to my next point. Fortunately, in the UK, we don't have any vicious, nasty beasts that can come and eat me alive in my uh, hammock. But we do have vicious squirrels. You have to be careful of them. They can really nibble at stuff. So you need to be careful. One of the biggest problems that you could have in the UK is deadfall. Look at these branches here. They're gone. They're rotted. They are a potential deadfall. These could fall on you at any time without warning. They don't let you know, they're just gonna drop. And if it's stormy and windy, and if you don't believe me, just have a look down on the ground but underneath them, and you will see large limbs of the tree which have fallen. In fact, this little copse is full of fallen trees. They're everywhere. And these are the things that can get you. Let's just have a quick pan round, see if we can see any more. There you go, there is a tree which has fallen over, leaning up against another tree. So that's hung up, the cluster's hung up. And even right behind me, we have a broken limb there. So here we go then, um, our tree hugger. This um, small tree is more than adequate to support my weight. How do I know? Because I've been on here many a time before. And all we do is wrap our tree hugger around the tree, around about head height. Now it does look like I'm being a bit higher on this one. And that's purely simply because it's a little bit of a drop where I'm stood. So overall it's right. So we go round and round the tree, protecting the back. We come out our other end and we attach our carabiner to that bit there. 
and away we go. Now then, if my whoopee swings weren't long enough and I'd had them fully extended and I couldn't quite make it to the tree, there is an alternative I can use and that's using what we call the marlin spike to give us a little bit more distance and I'll explain that now this, using this little peg that I've got dangling off my carabiner. So I've got into a position, I can't quite reach the tree wrapping it around this way. So let's have a look at an alternative method using the marlin spike. We've realised then that we can actually make the distance so we're going to grab our loops and we're going to put one loop through the other loop. Now DD hammock, these are DD tree huggers and they stipulate that you are not supposed to support with these slings using this method. That's because they want them, they won't guarantee the stitching will hold at that but you can edge you can edge your bets a little bit by taking a lot of the pressure off the knot by using the tree and friction around the tree taking a lot of pressure off the stitching so really in effect the tree and the friction from the tree is giving you a lot of stability what do we do then well first of all we need to make a loop Once we've made a loop, we fold it over and pull out this bit. Put in your marlin spike and tighten down. Now that you've got yourself some extra room, you leave your carabiner dangling and you hang your whoopee sling over the marlin spike, over the knot itself, and you have now just extended your reach with your slings and that's how that works. So that is the marlin spike being used and the reason why or one of the reasons why you would use it. You could use that system all the time if you wished. It's quite flexible. You can move that knot up and down. It's entirely up to you but that is how it's used. To remove and to undo the marlin spike simply pull the toggle and it all comes away. That's it. Job done. Now then, uh, we're moving, we've gone to tree huggers. We know if you want to look at carabiners, you can look at that on another video. Um, we've had a look at the marlin spike. Now let's have a quick look at the whoopee slings. Whoopee slings, bit of a strange name, isn't it, whoopee slings? Don't know why they're called whoopee slings. No idea, they just are. Um, they are made from Amstil, and they're very adjustable. Uh, I think these are seven foot, I made these seven foot, and they can give you an awful lot of um, movement, adjustment, and they do not stretch. So as soon as you sit in it, that is what you're going to end up. You will not end up on the floor in the morning. You won't um, stretch yourself down or it's not bouncy at all. It's perfectly rigid, perfectly secure, and you will not break those. <laughs> not a chance, unless you cut it with a knife. Uh, so let's have a look at the whoopee sling then in a little bit more detail. Let's have a look here. Okay, you will notice that one seems to feed into the other and this is a loose end and that is a loose end so that falls into that if we look a bit further up so the loop is buried inside the whoopee sling itself moving down to the up bit you can adjust which is here. To adjust a whoopee sling uh, with no gear in it is quite easy. When it's full of gear it can be a little bit dodgy which is why some people don't like it sometimes but let me show you how to adjust it. To adjust a whoopee sling simply pull the loop through and you will see it extend And all I gotta do to tighten it up is pull it the other way. And away you go. It works on the Chinese puzzle principle. So, you know, if you pull it apart, it spreads and it's easy to move. But as soon as you put tension on it, it grips. You can't move it when it's when it's gripping each other. Right, so adjust it that way. Adjust it that way. This is how you get your height correct on your hammock. Mentioned it many times before my gathered end, 
and my drip ring perfectly forming. That is exactly as it should be. Any rain comes down here will first hit this, but then anything coming down here will drip off there. And in previous videos, you will have seen that working perfectly well. The built into my uh, ex loops, my continuous loops, and, and, and that simply is all there is to it. That, that's, that's it. All that is remaining to do now is to get this hammock at the right height so I can have a comfortable night's sleep. Taking your time here will make the difference. This is a double layered hammock. In other words, there's two layers of material. You see that? Two layers of material. I can put a mat in there if I wish. Not this mat. Another mat. What I need to do? Sit in it. Now I want it so my feet are touching the ground. I'm not too high off. About 500 to 400 mil. I may just have that a little higher. Slight adjustment, and away we go again. Now my feet are off the floor. That puts a lot of pressure on this edge here and it's not comfortable at all. So I think just another couple inches down. There we go. That feels comfortable to me. I'm happy with that. Now it's time to put my other gear on, my under blanket, my top quilt, and my um, 2QZQ under quilt protector. Now I'm going to put in my top quilt. Awesome. Same as, fluff it up. This will probably be too hot for me. But the beauty of top quilts is that you can actually pop your leg out, pop your arm out, cool yourself down. Wonderful. I'm now going to put on my underquilt protector. Uh, this is a very light, I, I mean, I don't think I've actually ever weighed this, but it's just so light. It's like a, it probably weighs less than a bin bag. Looks like one, but it weighs less than a bin bag. Trash bag. Uh, so there you go, that's it. Now, as I was saying, faffing, yeah. Bit of faffing, but bloody hell, how comfortable is that? You can't sleep better than that out in the Hulu. You can't. I don't, I've, I've, I've slept outside practically all my life um, at weekends and stuff. I've, you know, with, with the military, with the army cadets when I was a kid. Uh, before that, when I was fishing, young lad fishing on my own, I used to go out and I used to go, uh, overnight fishing with us all on my own and, and I've been doing this all my life and and I have never ever ever slept any more comfortable than I have in a hammock and and I'm not just saying that just because I'm, I got one I'm saying it because it's true and until you experience it until you do it right you you won't believe me probably but I'm telling you it is it's fantastic don't know many people that go back so from the beginning we put our tree huggers on we put our whoopee slings on. We created our hammock, built up the layers, and got it hung at the right height. We then got our tarp out. Now you can put the tarp up first if you wish, it's entirely up to you. And the way I've got this tarp set up is called a lean-to porch mode. 
So basically one side is completely sheltered and I have a very shallow porch. I just like it like that. I, there, there is enough protection there and, and should the wind not drive into me from that direction then I will be perfectly fine and it doesn't take long should I need to adjust it and, and actually join it in the middle, the middle's there and then make the standard A-frame. So there we go, a quick drive by using a stick to help me in the porch mode that is a tidy little shelter and the more you come around the more you will see that it is actually sheltered and that cannot you cannot argue and say that does not look good That looks real comfy. One thing I'm going to point out to you, I have got more protection at the head end. So I've got a longer distance from the head end than I have at my feet end. Why have I done that? Well, there is a reason. And the reason being, down there, is where I'm going to put my Bergen, my gear, and everything else. That's the reason. So even all my gear is going to be protected, and I've got a little extra room on the end there to, to do it that way. And that's all that's about. Look at that beautiful tree. Isn't that amazing? That's been around for some time, hasn't it? What else am I doing this weekend? Um, I can't just be it. I'm not going to spend the entire weekend shooting um, but I tell you what I am doing I'm having a quick beer it's only a small beer four percent it is called a flat tire sparkling cloudy cider with rhubarb rhubarb seems to be the in flavor at the moment everyone's having it with gin and all sorts of stuff but I've brought two of these with me um, well I've actually brought four two today two tomorrow that, that's what I've brought and you know <laughs> there's not enough alcohol in there to worry me uh, so there you go. There you go. Flat tire. Should we give it a try? Respect Mr. Hayes. Drive by. It definitely smells like um, rhubarb and custard, which isn't really a surprise. That's made my eyes water. It's a, uh, it's a bitter one. It's very tangy. Uh, it's nice, nice aftertaste, but <laughs> but it makes you shudder. Let's see if oh god, yeah, that's it. that one makes you shudder. <laughs> I, you, you couldn't drink many of these. The sugar content on that must be amazing. I'll be buzzing all night. <laughs> there you go. Now, seriously, what have we got else going on? Uh, I've brought my axe. I've brought my uh, Barrel 21. I've brought my uh, backhoe. I brought my more knife. Why have I brought all those? I've been using these now for a couple of years. And I want to talk about the various different items, the pros and cons, and why I don't normally bring them all together at once anymore. Admin done. So let's have a look at what we've got going on. We've already seen our hammock. There's some bag down by the side. Got a little bit of a table on. A little bit of a cutting board or whatever I want to use that for. Maybe to hold my pans, keep the bottom of my pans out of the mud and I've got my firewood prepped I've not got a lot for tonight but I'm like I say I'm gonna be uh, out until last light anyhow in a minute so I'm gonna disappear soon out shooting uh, I've done my pot hanger ready um, yeah, stuck into the ground one holding it down one holding it up 
we come along to the top and we flatten off the edge and I think it's called a bird mouth cut we create our pot hanger there like that and that's how we do it let's have a look at one complete let's see if we can see through it there you go Basically that's it. The way it simply works is when the fire's good, up there, when the fire starts to die down, down there. Now, one thing you will notice, or you may not have noticed, there is just a little hole in the top there for that point or the bird's mouth to sit into. And basically when that does that, it just won't fall off. A pivot rock, but it won't fall off. There we are. Pot hanger, very basic. Takes about five minutes to make once you know what sticks to get, <laughs> and that's the key. Just one more thing I'm, I'm gonna disappear now, go for a walk. Camp is all right, camp's down there, can stay there, and uh, no one's coming up here. Nobody. I'm going to be walking about two to three hundred meters away. Um, just one thing I'm going to just, uh, show you before it gets dark this evening, and it's called Nordic Summer. It's uh, a natural midge mosquito repellent. Perhaps a little early to be using it this time of the year, but it's in my kit now and I'm going to be giving it a try this year. Well, not this year, I'm going to be giving it a try and if it works, great. It smells like uh, burnt pine. It's beautiful. You know when you've had your fire lit and all your kit stinks of fire afterwards? Well, if you like that smell, it's like that. I love that smell. I love opening up my tarp and smelling the fire from the previous time. So uh, I'm not going to have a problem putting this on at all. Anyway, time to go now. I will, the next time this camera goes on it, it'll be dark, I'll be light, or, or just getting dark, uh, and I will be lighting the fire and making some dinner and having my second tin. <laughs> Whoopie doo. Well, like I always say, alcohol and guns, they don't mix. I got them going now. I love doing this. You can't hear the distant ones, but I can. I love doing that. Calling in the owls, it's great fun. If you've never tried it, give it a go. It's good fun. 
Well, I got my fire. I'm just gonna let that burn down a bit and I'll start cooking. I'll get my tea on. I'm gonna have chickpea curry with naan bread. That's what I'm having tonight. It is actually it's still pretty chilly. I'm, I'm glad I brought the warm clothes that I did. You will, you'll just see that and you would have just seen that a little bit of calling the owls now. The first time I ever did that was a bit of fun and what I never realised was the owl landed right next, next, behind me, literally right behind me. That's why I know they sort of like make this purring noise when, 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 they're, when they're close or they've landed or perched or whatever. And it absolutely frightened me to death the first time I did it. So <laughs> they've been doing it ever since. Yeah, so um, that, them calling in the owls is, is quite funny. Uh, I remember Dave used to was laughing at me once when I said, "Oh, let's do it," and I was telling him the story that I just told you, and he went, "Yeah, whatever." And, and then we heard an owl hoot and tee wit, so you got the male and the female, and uh, <laughs> I started doing it, and uh, the female came right in and landed in the tree right above us, and it was quite funny. And we could see it just in the silhouette of, of the light that was left. Yeah, it was good. I'm using my uh, police spork. <laughs> Support your local police. They look after you. You look after them. Now that's an interesting shot of the moon through the trees. Very nice indeed. Well, I thought I'd have a bit of a blast for the last one. It's uh, time to turn in for the night, so I thought I'd have a bit of heat just to tuck me in. Now, you can probably just hear the rain. I mean, that just about works out perfect, doesn't it? Line under your tarp, warm as toast, listen to the rain. Does it get any better than that? And uh, a jolly, jolly good night to you all. This might not be everybody's cup of tea and how to enjoy yourself, but I can tell you, this is so relaxing, it's unbelievable. So I will see you in the morning. I've just made that deer very, very angry. There he is. That's their warning, see when they bark like that. Now the plan was to uh, get up early and have uh, a lookout, but unfortunately I slept in. Despite the beautiful morning, clear sky, sunny, it just uh, I just didn't want to get up, and I've got to be honest, so I didn't. The only thing that really woke me up this morning was the uh, roebuck barking when it literally walked right on top of me. It frightened itself to death and ran off. <laughs> of course, by the time we got the camera out, it, it was well gone, but it, it really scared itself. It was quite funny. Uh, if you don't move, if you don't do anything, they, they can't see you. They won't see you. But as soon as you sort of shift or nudge and, and they see the movement, but he was right on top of me and he just he just went, What the? Oh! <laughs> Barked as it ran off. So it was quite funny that. Uh, but I knew, I knew. Finding that cooch yesterday, I knew that he would come back, or somebody would come back to that spot. That's obviously where they like cooching up, and that's what they'll do. I've just noticed this deer cooch. The cooch is where they lie up, and by getting close, you can see the hairs of the deer in amongst the grass and the impression in the ground. Now, why would it choose this spot? Well, 
drawn in simply because it's sheltered from the normal wind that comes that way but they also like to be able to look out and see what's coming too so they've got good vantage point good view what's coming any dangers shelter from the prevailing wind lovely little spot just noticed it it's literally 20 feet from where I am dear cooch when you don't have very expensive coffee machines but you want a really nice coffee you can make what's known as cowboy coffee <coughs> cowboy coffee is literally what it says put yourself some water in a pan now the way I do this is that I hang my pot first so when I put my coffee in it doesn't spread all over the sides so you put your water in your pan hang over your fire or sit on your fire whichever way you want to do it grab your coffee take out more than you would normally think so at least one two I'm gonna put three in three three spoonfuls of coffee there and then we're gonna let that boil and bring it to the boil <clears throat> once it's got to the boil we let it actually simmer for no more than a minute and then we take it off the heat and I'll get back to you when we're good to go notice though because I put my coffee in after I sat the pot I've got no coffee stuck around the sides when the water's splashing and so I've got no coffee stuck anywhere else except in the water full boil for one minute just like that And there you go. This is where <coughs> some opinions may differ. Some people, like the Woods Walker in 1965 and many others, will tap the cup and that will help sink the grits inside the pan itself however other people like the uh, really big monkey one will add a drop of cold water into the coffee and that will also help sink the grits to the bottom and enable you to drink your coffee straight away cheers you can seriously overestimate or underestimate the amount of coffee that you need in your cup and it really is trial and error and if you don't do it very often you can overdo it I've just overdone it by one spoonful of coffee there didn't read that last one this, this is very very strong coffee I won't sleep for a fortnight but um, I'm not gonna say to you on camera that this is the best coffee I've ever tasted it's a bit strong but what I will say is normally it's the best coffee I've ever tasted <laughs> I could just go I, I tell you what this is what some people do Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, that's gorgeous. And you don't see that bit, do you? This is nice coffee. It really is nice coffee, and that is a great way to make coffee. This one's a bit strong. But it is quite nice. I won't bluff you. 
I have to. I have to give a shout out to a couple of people. Um, first and foremost, Paul Stubbs and Jean. Uh, I know. I think you've you've gone somewhere today. I work with Paul. He's a site manager like me. He's very good, and I enjoy working with him. And I don't know how his missus puts up with him, but here's to you two. And the other one has to be uh, Charlotte and Dan. They're they're a young couple, and I've and I've uh, and I've known Charlotte for a couple of years now, and she's such a nice kid. And they have got engaged last year, and she is now with child. I don't know how that happened. Um, and they're both very, very excited. So here's to you two. Here's to the newborn. And I hope everything goes extremely well for you. And more importantly, a massive congratulations from me. But I really don't know how that happened. Take care, you two. This little bit is for Paul outdoors. Paul, can you see my tree? I planted this one last year. I thought it died, but it appears to be still kicking. So there we are, Paul. Secret tree planting. I know you'd be proud of me, mate. Okay, tools. I've got various different types of tools with me. And I'm just going to go over now a couple of things for each one after a couple of years of use. And just to give you my thoughts on them. And we'll start with the Moore knife. This is a Moore companion. About £12. It's a very basic knife, it's not a full tang or anything. A full tang, for those who don't know, is the metal going from the tip of the knife all the way through the handle and then comes out at the back. Okay, and usually with a stud or you can see the piece of metal sticking out the back. That is known as a full tang, okay? Um, these aren't, they, I don't know whether they're three quarters. Do you know what, I don't know. And it doesn't make any difference anyhow because these are fantastic for the money. You can't go wrong. You don't need to go out and get yourself a knife made by Mr. Knife Maker straight away, okay? I, we would all love to have a beautiful knife and we'd all love to have one made for us per personally, but if you can't afford it, there's absolutely nothing wrong with those. Some of the best bushcrafters in the world would happily use a Moore knife, but obviously they've been given these fancy knives to use by people who make them. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm saying, that's a very expensive thing, and I don't have that money, and I'm sure most of us don't. Quick move on to the Baco. Baco Laplander. An excellent pruning knife. Up to about 100 millimeters timber. That will cut through. Knife through butter, a saw through butter, even. Um, Two years of using that, absolutely no complaints whatsoever. I can't fault it. I, I can't. There are, they're in competition with Silky. These cut on the forward stroke and the reverse stroke. Silky cut on the pull stroke, so your forward movement isn't cutting, your reverse movement is cutting. Um, but people who have Silky swear by Silky. People who use these swear by these. Some will cross over, vice versa, whatever. There can't be that much in it. I don't believe there's going to be that much in it. Okay, so Silky or Laplander, you can't fall off. There are budget versions out in Asda. I think they were £3.49 last time I seen them. And they're in, they're in the shops now in Asda. So go to the gardening section and you'll see budget versions of this. If you want one, get one. I, I recommend you get one of them budget ones. They're fantastic for the money. And they, they're very good. But these, faultless. No problem with that whatsoever. My axe. 
This is a Hunter Classic. It is made by Holterfors. And the reason it's a Hunter Classic is because the, the, the rear of the axe, I think it's called the pole, is slightly rounded on the edges. See the rounded edges there? And the reason it's rounded like that is to enable you to use it to skin hides. And you grab the hide when it's hanging and you use, you grab it one hand, you pull and you, and you use it to force the skin away from the hide, or from the meat. And that's what, that's what you can use that for. And, and because it's rounded, it won't cut. That's why it's a Hunter's Classic. Okay, Halter Force Hunter's Classic. You are able to use it with two hands. It's long enough and you can use it with one hand. Notice the cord I have at the bottom. That goes round over like that. That really pulls that in tight for me. So that's a really, really good strong way to hold the axe with one hand should you wish to. I prefer to use it two-handed and chop as you would. Uh, you, c you can put your hand into this groove here and you can sort of carve with it slightly. Make good for making points, arrow, you know, points of sticks and stuff like that. You probably could be a bit more detailed with it, but it's not really designed for carving. It is a lightweight axe, 600 mil, or 620 long, and it's designed that you can put it in your pack if you wish. It's probably, it is the only axe that I've got, apart from the little tiny hatchet that I showed on a previous video. But that is an excellent axe, and it holds its edge very, very well. I used this all day. No, I didn't. I used this quite a lot yesterday afternoon and it's still got an exceedingly good edge on that okay so if you're up for an axe a halter force classic huntsman will cost you in the region between 60 to 70 pounds maybe a little bit more don't know if you go to the Gainsborough axes just put another 30 quid on that easy because Ray Mir uses them so they are gonna put another 30 quid on it because if Ray Mir uses stuff it's gonna go up it's like carp tax. If you're a carp fisherman and you want it for carping, carp tax means there's another 20 quid on it because it's carping stuff, all right? So there you go. If you're up for an ax, you can't go wrong with that one. Right, on to the Barrel 21 made by Agawa Canyon. It's a folding bolsel, 21 inches long. I now have the handmade or the hand sharpened blade in it. What can I say about it? It is the best bushcraft tool I've ever purchased, ever. It's a lot of money, and I think they're going up in price too. And they're making a, a longer one. I think this is a 21. I think they've got a, a, a 24 or something coming out. I don't know. Um, I paid 60 pound for it. And at the time I thought I was insane. I was really, really having my fingers crossed to see if it was any good. And I can assure you now, the more I use it, the more I love it. It's still as tight and the frame's still as square and true as it was the day that I purchased it. And I use it an awful, awful lot, even at home. And uh, <laughs> I can't fault it at all. If, you're, if you want to treat yourself to an exceedingly good bushcraft tool or a woodworking tool, you can't fall off with that. You really can't, you can't. Right, now I did say in a previous video, which was bushcraft tools on a budget, um, you know, try with the cheaper stuff, work your way up to the more expensive stuff, and that still stands, but uh, that's not the most expensive axe. That's not the most expensive knife, and it's definitely not the most expensive pocket saw. That, however, is pretty much right up there with the top. Okay, um, you can find wooden versions, the traditional type bow saw, which you come together and you, it all comes in little bits and string and you tighten it up and you do that way. That I don't, I'm not slagging them at all. What's wrong with that? 
I've brought all these with me today, but I wouldn't normally do that. I wouldn't normally carry my saw, axe and backhoe. I would usually carry my axe and backhoe, or I would just bring that. I've just used that in the past, and and if I need to um, do any splitting, I use my mower knife and batten down with the mower knife. Now, some people say you shouldn't batten with a mower knife, or you shouldn't batten with knives at all. At all. Why not? Why not? What's wrong with doing it? I can't for the life of me think of any decent reason why if you use it sensibly and don't try and cut a tree down with a mower and knife, why can you not use a baton on a knife? Okay, moving on. Gloves. Pretty much every time I go collecting timber in some shape, form or fashion, if I do not have my gloves on, I will cut, bang, scrape, scratch myself in some way. Uh, oh, here in the UK, 10 minutes away from civilization, probably not a major drama. But if I was out in the woods and I got a cut which was infected and I was quite a few days away from anybody, that could get a lot worse before I actually got to any medical care. Now, not using gloves collecting wood is a bit of a bad thing really. You should always use some gloves just to protect yourself for those exact reasons. So, gloves, a good pair of gloves are important to make sure that you look after your hands when you're collecting timber because you can easily cut yourself and I quite often do when I don't wear them so you know take a leaf out of my book learn the lessons make, let me make the mistakes and you pick up from there okay bushcraft tools that's it I wouldn't be without one of them I think they're all fantastic I've really enjoyed using them, I've really enjoyed learning how to use them. The most dangerous one of the lot is clearly the axe. That is a lethal, lethal piece of equipment. You really do need to know how to use this properly. You really do need to know and watch some videos on and, and how to chop and how to use it safely. Um, you'll see a lot of people kneeling down and stuff like that and there's a reason they're doing it and it's not because they're tired. It's because if they lose control of the axe, when it does fly off or come out of your hand, it's not going to go straight into your shin leg, knee, foot, hand, it's going to go into a piece of timber or into the ground and that's the reason why they do that. So you need to learn how to use this piece of equipment before you go out there and start chopping things down and chop your toes off. Okay, because <laughs> you will. Right, that's enough of that, let's move on to weapons. If I ever get any thumbs down it's usually because I've got Black Bess with me. Black Bess is a 2.4.3. It's a full bore rifle, um, centre fire, and it's got a Wildcat 8 on the end of it. That is quite a dated moderator now. There are much lighter ones out there on the market, and it also has a bipod on the front. I use this rifle to take out um, deer, red deer roe deer, foxes, or any other small mammals. It's not really suitable for rabbits at this velocity and this size around. If I shoot a rabbit with this, the rabbit usually disintegrates. Um, it's good, it's very effective at what it does, but it's definitely what you would call overkill for rabbiting. It's not something that you would use. The 17 HMI that I use is probably ideal for rabbits and up to foxes, and that's it. Some people say it's not suitable for foxes, but I totally disagree with that, totally disagree. Um, you will see on the, I did do a video earlier in the end, it said uh, the 17 HMR can travel up to two miles. So can this really. Um, when you look at the ammunition, um, let's have a look at the ammunition. Um, the ammunition for it is, uh, no that's not the ammunition, that's my flask. It's not a cannon. <laughs> the ammunition for it, I make myself, what I've got in here are uh, 85 ground nozzlers, I made these in 2014, um, yeah, let me have a zoom in on those, so I make them myself, there you go.
very deadly, very accurate, and you certainly would not want to be in its way. I'm not going to get into you about the ethics of hunting. Pretty much irrelevant, really. You either you either support it, you don't support it, or you have no comment on it whatsoever. Uh, but like I say, it is usually the, the reason that I would get thumbs down. As soon as I get the rifle out, people start going, oh, I'm a, I'm a murderer, they hate me and everything else. Well, just keep your comments to yourself. I'm not really interested in whether you hate me or not. Okay, if you want to leave a comment on the video, if it's a nice one, an okay one, that's great. If you want to ask me a question, that's great. If you want to be a dick and you want to be a troll, I am not going to play games with you. I cannot be bothered to deal with you. So I just cancel you, delete you from the conversation. You cannot and will not be able to make other comments. And also, I'll just report you. You just get reported, simple as. Uh, I'm not breaking the law, am I? I've said that before. You probably are, by being rude and offensive. So keep your nasty comments to yourself. I'm not interested. And leave my friends alone too. <laughs> That's it, that's all we're gonna talk about. Um, we're gonna go back down to the camp. I'm gonna collect a bit of firewood for later. Uh, make sure I've got a really good fire. I can see some big timbers up here. I might grab some of them while I'm here as well. And I'll see you later on. Okay, thank you very much. That is the uh, patented Nam bread holding device. Chili and rice and naan bread. Let's not forget, of course, our final beer, and that is the Elk Warning. Again, four percent. Yeah, four percent. So not a very strong beer. Um, this one is Elk Warning, crafted apple cider with blackberries. Actually, that's quite pleasant. I like that one. So, it's dinner time. I'll get back to you when I've eaten. Um, just put a load of more logs on the fire. I'm not going to stay out late tonight. Two reasons. One, I can't be bothered. And the other one is, I can't be bothered. So I'm just going to chill and relax here by the fire for a couple hours. And then I'm going to turn in. However, what we haven't had for a while is a story. So uh, let's have a story, shall we? Now, some of you may have watched the recent video of uh, my darling wife and I um, walking in the Cairngorms. And some of you commented on uh, Karen's <laughs> sense of humour. And that's very very astute of you because she has a great sense of humor which is one of the things that attracted me to her in the first place many 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 years ago when we were in our early 20s um, <laughs> and it always reminds me when I try to explain her sense of humor to somebody I can only give an example of of uh, how it is and so I'm going to give you the same example Some of you may know that years ago I was in the TA and I used to go away an awful lot. <laughs> well, time was coming up where I was going away for quite a few weeks and uh, I, we were prepping and doing what we normally do and making sure everything was right around the home before we bugged out. And we were browsing through the Sunday paper at the time, we used to have a paper in the house. I don't have newspapers in the house anymore, fake news. And it, the Sunday magazines or the Sunday papers used to be full of freebies, didn't they? I don't know if you can remember. I don't even know if they still are. And always, always, there was always this glossy um, freebie digest or something. I have no idea what it was. And at the back, of the very last page, was always, always, always plates. And there was either a plate of a Lancaster bomber, Spitfires, 
kitty cats or dogs or some other animal cutie pie type, type thing and they used to charge you £29 for the plate, collector's item only so many made. And they were shite. <laughs> and it always made, used to make me laugh when I can imagine people buying them and I used to think to myself, why on earth would anybody buy one of those? Because they're not quality, they're just prints on crappy plates and, and, and you're paying 29 quid for it. So what if there's only 2,000 made? They're still worthless. Um, anyway, <laughs> we were looking through and she said, wasn't that nice, that? And I went, what? She said, that? Looking at the plate and I went, you don't even like cats. And on the plate were two little kittens. I said, you, you don't like cats? She goes, oh, I, I like that though. I said, no, you, you're joking, right? I said, I mean, no, surely not. You, well, I don't know, I might. I might. Look, I said, look, don't. I said, it's absolute rubbish. It's, it's a waste of £29. Your money, but, you know, I'd rather you didn't. If I had a choice, I'd rather you didn't. Right oh, she said. Anyway, I went away, came back some weeks later. Um, we used to live in a two up, two down house then at the time. Nothing fancy. Literally, two rooms downstairs, two rooms upstairs. That's all there was to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> bit like Coronation Street, you know those uh, you know those terraced houses with little yards at the back and a road between the other house with a yard at the back. One of them. So we came in off the front door. So you 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 you, you parked your car up, and immediately you, as you walked through the door, there was a, a three foot vestibule, and then you was into your into your room, into your front room. So it was like a, a one pace, and in you go. So I, I held my kit with me, and I was dragging it through the door, and opened the first door, got into the front room, clunk clunk clunk, dropped my kit. It's just you know you know that oh great to be home. And you know, you, you, you look around and instantly caught my eye was a plate on top of the fireplace. Now I had been back 30 seconds and my heart sank and I just went, oh no, because it was awful. And I thought, well, you know, if she has spent the money, it ain't even staying there. It's not staying there. There's no way I'm looking at that. So she didn't come down immediately. Uh, I was just messing with my kit and every time I looked up I could see this plane I was getting angry and angry Well when she came down she went hi I went ah oh, hi love. and I couldn't help myself I says what is that? She went what do you think? I said what do I think? I said it's awful It's awful She goes I think it's absolutely fantastic I said well it's not staying there She goes why not? I said because well, I don't want it staying there She goes well I think it's going to stay there and of course I was getting angrier and angrier and angrier and I was inching my way over towards this plate because I felt like I was going to pick it up and throw it and I was getting angrier she was winding me up and winding me up and winding me up and just as I got within just arm's reach of the plate something wasn't right about it and that's when a penny dropped I just looked at her and said you git and what she'd done on purpose knowing too well it would wind me up the magazine that she got that day before I left she saved she cut the picture of the plate out and stuck it to a real plate <laughs> left it there waiting for me to come home <laughs> knowing too well the minute I walk through the door yeah I'm gonna get angry she was right, wasn't she? <laughs> so that just about sums up my wife's sense of humour. So those of you who are astute enough to uh, to notice that, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yes, yeah, she has a great sense of humour, and, and that's why we get on so well. Because I'm just as daft as she is. All right, the story's over.
Another advantage of having your tarp in this configuration is you are completely open to the elements. You still feel like you've got some shelter, so you still feel that slightly bit protected, but you are completely open to the elements. And on a night like tonight, I can see the moon coming up again, and you know, full moon. And uh, if we get some stars out later, you know, I can lie in my hammock and look up at the stars and look at the galaxies and constellations that I can see. And it's amazing, totally, totally amazing just to lie here, warm as toast, looking up and knowing, you know, that you're perfectly sound. It's, it's a wonderful feeling and it's far, far better than being in a tent where you have no vision, you have no sight, you have no concept of what's going on around you. It's just totally different. I can hear the music from the campsite a couple of miles away and that's one of the reasons I don't do campsite camping anymore. The etiquette of camping is gone. People can go and buy a tent, beds and everything else for 250 quid. The, the job lot for six of them and they just leave it there. You should see the mess left after a bank holiday down on that campsite because I know the farmer who owns it. The mess is disgraceful. The, the, the etiquette the, is gone. They don't care about the noise they make. They're not interested about keeping people awake all night. I won't go anywhere near campsites. No, absolutely not. They're, they're just rubbish. Not all of them are like that, but some of them are. That what is. It's half past five now, Sunday morning, and I'm feeling quite refreshed. And, and I think that is why I come and do this. I've still got all Sunday ahead of me and feel like I've been away for two days. When actually, in fact, it's sort of like 36 hours, but I feel good. I feel ready to take on whatever the missus can throw at me today. <laughs> and she will. So that's it. It was more of about chilling, relaxing, and having some time to myself than it was anything else. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Perhaps a little bit different. Didn't really have anything to show you, didn't really have anything to talk about and say, but it was just me doing what I do. And there you go. So thank you for joining me. And see you next time. Next time... Ooh, I don't know, I may get another one of these and I may get a fishing session in. But like I said, I've still got two huge sessions coming up, fishing sessions. Uh, they're, they're on the way. And I'm, I'm all my bait and everything's purchased for that. So looking forward to those big time. And here comes a new day. See you soon. Bye-bye.